You're tuning in to the Black Hollywood Live Network, featuring news, interviews, and commentary on all things Black Hollywood. Hollywood redefined. From Los Angeles, California, presented by Maria Menounos and streaming live thanks to Akamai Technologies, this is Black Hollywood Live Portraits, featuring intimate, in depth interviews with Black Hollywood stars and influencers. Black Hollywood Live, Hollywood redefined. You're listening to Black Hollywood Live. And now, the host for Black Hollywood Live Portraits, Dario Kristen. Hey everyone, you're watching Black Hollywood Live Portraits. I'm your host, Dario Kristen, and here joining me in the studio today is Courtney Stewart. What's up, everybody? And our very special guest, you know her from classic films such as Half Plenty, Hitch, 13 Going on 30, and now she is the star of one of the new series on BET, Being Mary Jane. We have a beautiful Robin Lee with us today. Hello. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming in on this holiday approaching week. Christmas is around the corner. It's crazy. Literally around the corner. I bought my first gift today. <laughs> I'm a little behind. You're schedule. ahead of me, actually. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, actually, you're ahead of me, too. I'm like, Ooh. Do you have any exciting holiday plans? Um, I'm going to Florida. My parents retired to Florida years back, and we go every Christmas and spend time with the family. Spend time with the family. It's any, not a bad place. I mean, not like it's cold here, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's 80 degrees today. today. <laughs> but still. That's true. <laughs> Good old California. You never know Good what you're going to get. You don't know what you're going to get. <laughs> Any special New Year's resolutions you got? Um, you know, I made some great resolutions last year, and I kind of want to keep with that. And it wasn't like specifically saying itemizing list of things to do. It was just more of how I was going to live my life and try new things and challenge myself in new ways. And I did, and it was, it's been a great year. I ran my first marathon. Mm -hmm. Wow. I returned to ballet after taking 25 years off. Like, I started just living every day differently yeah so i kind of want to continue that because it was really good you sh it used to be like okay i'm gonna weigh this amount and i'm yeah. gonna do that <laughs> exactly. like, i'm going to lose 12 pounds <laughs> right <laughs> no, I have no more ice cream <laughs> like those things they don't last very long and they don't make you very happy but this was just something that just continually made me happy and i want to continue that what made you change how you did your resolutions this year i don't know i think i just wanted to live differently and kind of enjoy life more and not look at it as something like restricting myself from some from doing things as yeah. opposed to bringing new things into my life and expanding the way I saw the world and expanding the way I lived and really kind of taking taking chances and daring myself and trying new things. Trying new things. Fabulous way to live. I need to write my resolution as well. <laughs> Try new things. I need to add that to it. Try new things. Try new things. Yeah, Don't be does. afraid to go out of the box. <laughs> <laughs> now you grew up in New York. I did. I did. I grew up in Westchester County. And at, I heard at an early age, you always knew you wanted to be an actress watching Mr. Rogers. Yes, on the I did. TV. Mr. Rogers and like all Romper Room, all those shows, like those PBS shows. Um, I used to wonder how people got in the television. Like I remember very specifically, this is back in the day with the old box TVs, you know, walking around the back of the TV and kind of looking in <laughs> and like, <laughs> how are these people in here and how can I get in here? And I really, really wanted to do it. And my parents were, they're both from Jamaica. They had that immigrant mentality about, you know, education, education. You're not going to go and go to Hollywood and be a star or an actor or anything, kind of, any kind of nonsense like that. Um, and so they kind of just encouraged me to stay in school. And they let me do school plays and little things like regional theater, but nothing really professional until after I'd graduated college. And I was like, I think I'm ready to get out there and really do it. And they said... But there's law school. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> I made a deal with them, and I, I signed up to take the LSAT at the same time I started acting in New York, and I did law school and, and was acting the same time, simultaneously. And then after graduating law school, I moved out here. Mm -hmm. So did you always know, even while you were in college getting your degrees, that acting was in your future? You knew that you would circle back around to it? Probably. Probably. I mean, I think, yeah. Yeah, it was something that I was even doing while I was in school and, and loving it so much and wondering how I could do it and do it in a, prof not just a professional as an actress, but I started thinking like a, a backwards way, like maybe I could have my own studio or I could be a producer or I could go into entertainment law like, and then put myself in my own films like so I can get little, a tiny little part. And then I thought, you know, why don't I just pursue what I really want to pursue as, as opposed to feeling like the only way to go about it is the business way or yeah. the, the legal way or legal meaning as a lawyer and mm -hmm. not not uh, the illegal way. <laughs> 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 because there's that too. There is that. <laughs> <laughs> what was the catalyst for you to finally make that leap and decide I'm doing it today? Like that's where I'm going. Um, I don't know, just this realization that you only live once and if I didn't try it, 
I was only going to be kicking myself years down the line and just to jump in and do it. Okay. And you have kids. So if your kids wanted to grow up to be actresses, no. what would you say? <laughs> yeah, or absolutely would you make them? Not. People ask me all the time, like, oh, aren't you sending them auditions? And no. I used to say that I would let them do it until they realized what was going on, and then I wouldn't let them do it. But they've, they're already past that age now. Like, my, <laughs> my youngest is, she, my daughter's four, and I feel like she would get it. And I, There's so much rejection and so much heartache and um, disappointment in this business. I, I'd hate to put that on a child who's still trying to form their identity and uh, become a person and, and to have, you know, you want to do everything you can to build their confidence and their strengths. And anyone telling them they're not good enough, I mean, they're going to get that out there in the real world anyway. I don't want to do it at the, to them at the age of five or eight or 13 even. Like, live your life a little and, and become a person, become who you're going to be before you get out there and you make the choice yourself. I don't want to push them into it. I mean, I, I suppose if one of them was begging me and begging me, I would have to be true to that, but they're not and I, I certainly don't want to encourage it. Now, it kind of started your career, you were working uh, at Elle magazine, correct, yes. in the editorial department? Yes. I and then like you studied, studied abroad? Right. I, I, was an inter I interned there all throughout college. Um, and then uh, I spent my junior year in Paris and worked for their French office while I was studying in Paris. And it was the most magical year of my life. <laughs> Paris okay. is... Was it culture shock at all, just like being there? Um, it was culture shock in the way that I'd taken eight years of French before ever getting off the plane. <laughs> and I got off the plane and I was like, I don't know what these people no, are speaking. <laughs> this sounds not... Because, you know, in French class, they, m my French teachers in high school at least did not have good French accents. And mm -hmm. it was like you're conjugating verbs, like je suis, tu es, il est, elle. And you get off the phone, uh, get off the plane and they're talking to you like... And they've got these, <laughs> these accents and like... <laughs> Oh my goodness, I remember getting <laughs> yelled at in the supermarket a couple of times. The sup shopping, I mean, food is a really big deal in France. Oh, and yeah. Yes. And for good reason. I mean, they're, they're excellent at it. But you go to these, these grand marché, which is where they, they have like, it's, I guess it's like Kmart before we even had Kmart. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know anything like that growing up. But they have supermarkets where you can also get clothes and like these m magnificent Magi places yeah. like um, Monupri and uh, Inno and these like really big... I love the way you said that. Huh? <laughs> 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 I remember going there to buy lunch. Like there's one near our, our, our school and I, I just want a little piece of cheese. And I was like, uh, un petit peu de fromage. And they're like, and she's asking me, she's showing me like, comme ça, comme ça, comme ça. And I was like, and I was trying to keep saying smaller, smaller, but I couldn't think of how to say smaller. I was saying a little bit, a little bit. And then she finally was like, wow, bleu. <laughs> I was like, wah, wah. <laughs> like, yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> one of those days you went home and you, <laughs> you stand up and you're like in shock and you're like, oh my gosh, she yelled at me. <laughs> the front the, the, the fromage lady yelled at me. Yeah, it was a. <laughs> it was an experience. <laughs> and I once got slapped. I'm sorry, I don't oh, know. Wait, I, I didn't oh, wow. No, no, it wasn't that bad. But they have these things called um, stand de dégustation, which is like. Um, like uh, sampling stands, like mm -hmm. in the supermarket when they have like little pieces of whatever, crackers and cheese, whatever. Um, and I went to take, you know, like they have a Costco, right? Have you guys yes, been to Costco? Oh, yeah. Costco. So <laughs> I've gone, I went to take a piece of whatever it was, and it was good, and I went back, because, you know, I'm a starving student. <laughs> I go back for a second piece, and she kind of gives me a look. And the third time, <laughs> I go back, she slapped my hand. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> I was <laughs> and of course, I'm looking around like, is this legal? Can she hit me? Right, this <laughs> like, is abuse right now. <laughs> it's like, uh, that's the French way, I guess. <laughs> yes, so that kind of culture shock I dealt with. <laughs> and uh, do you speak French in your house now I to your kids? I do, I do. I'm, I'm uh, fluent now. I was not when I was living there, and I, I really kind of worked on it my year there, but then also continuing to study and um, keep up my relationships with French-speaking people, and then my years at L and my friends that I've met through the magazine there. And uh, I... I kind of made the decision that I was going to raise my kids bilingually, no matter who I married, no matter where <laughs> I lived, yeah. because I felt like it was a gift that I could give them. Yeah. And I wish I'd had it, because it was such a struggle for me. And I'm, I'm so into learning about different cultures and languages and life outside of just like what we know and what we're familiar with. I want to, to give my kids that opportunity and that advantage. And so... I'm raising them bilingually in L.A. In L.A. <laughs> <laughs> and my husband doesn't speak any French. It's not, it has not That's been easy. <laughs> but it's I not wish I knew easy. French. It's I just know a little. Je parle le français un peu. Uh, voilà. <laughs> I don't want to say too much to them. Robin will start speaking to me back and I'll be like, uh, uh, no, that's I don't, I don't like know that. <laughs> that's where it is cut off. <laughs> so other than obviously progressing in your French life, what, what was the best thing that you took from sort of that experience so early on? Um, 
to not be afraid to try new things and get mm -hmm. out of your comfort zone and explore. I mean, I was so many miles from my parents and my culture, and you know, we're also a very Jamaican family, and I was far from that. And the, <laughs> I, I endeavored to make some Jamaican meals living in <laughs> Paris, <laughs> which is like <laughs> that I was trying to make. We make these things called Johnny Cakes, so like oh yeah. dumplings. Yeah. Yeah. And I had to get the um, baking soda. I didn't know how to say baking soda, or was oh. baking powder. Baking powder. I did not know how to say it, and I couldn't find it in any French. I mean, like, so like hunting that down to make my Jamaican meal in my tiny little Paris apartment. So, I mean, it was just, you know, it was, it was great, and I made friends, and once I was comfortable with it, and comfortable not being able to fully communicate, and you just have to kind of put yourself out there, yeah. it made me feel like, God, I can do anything. Like, I'm, here I am, like a student, and I'm living here, and I'm so far from everything I know, and like, I'm like, I'm making my way in the world. <laughs> like, doing I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah, it just felt like it was just this wonderful, like, present to give myself, and then knowing that I could go forward doing that at any point in time. And I think people need to, uh, not that everyone can afford to pick up and move to France or study abroad, but if you get the opportunity to try something new, I say go for it, no matter wh how terrified you are yeah. and wha how you think you might fail. Like, try, you'll never know. And the opportunities are few and far between, and just, just do it. And there's so many cultures out there just to learn and be yeah. you know, knowledgeable about that. I think that's great Yeah. to even just have that extra thing the going on for you, <laughs> the extra thing. Now, you also, outside of being a dynamic actress, you are a photographer. No, uh, mm. Or you, you, you <laughs> do, indulge in photography, I should I say. I do indulge. I haven't in a long time. Um, I, I did a lot. No, I shouldn't say not in a long time. I, I guess I do indulge. I just don't really call myself. I haven't, <laughs> call, I haven't called myself that since, like, college. Um, but I was, I was really into it in high school and college. And then part of what attracted me to working in fashion was, was just the love of, of images and composition. And Elle magazine at the time was, like, new and fresh. And it combined everything I love, which was these beautiful photographs by world-renowned uh, photographers like uh, Gilles Ben-Simon and mm, Marc yeah. Spa and Olivier Toscani. And um, I had the opportunity to, to meet these photographers who I'd admired for a long time. And it was really incredible. And I still, like, I spend, like, hours on Pinterest <laughs> now. <laughs> and that's what I'm doing. I'm, like, I'm, like, finding my favorite. It's, like, it. Pinterest is a little like hoarding, but yeah. without the clutter. <laughs> it is, yeah, without yeah. the clutter. And then also, the clutter. And then, digital clutter. And sometimes it's like shopping, but without <laughs> the, actual, the actual expense. Yeah. I mean, I feel very satisfied after I've created a, a perfect Pinterest page <laughs> of whatever it is that I'm, I'm coveting at the time. But I love like hoarding photographs of just like beautiful images, whether it's, you know, the water or fashion models, beauty shots, whatever. I, I'm just total, so taken in by what people can do, like Peter Lindbergh or Patrick de Marchelier. Oh, yeah. Those are like great names, too. Arthur Elgar. I mean, yeah, yeah I can go on and on. <laughs> For hours. Yeah. Now, do you take a lot of pictures of yourself and do the Instagram thing? I do a little. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's hard because I, I feel like at, once you have kids, the pictures stop being about you and start being about your kids. Yeah. And I don't like to, I don't Instagram pictures of my kids. So I, I've got all these photographs for me and my family and friends that I don't really share out there because they're my kids. And I kind of want to maintain their privacy as much as I can until they decide they want otherwise. Um, so I do, I do a few selfies every once in a while. <laughs> I do a lot of food and sunset shots, probably. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's funny you say selfies, because we talk about that subject a lot in the studio. Especially this past week. This past week. Go ahead, Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> How did you feel about the Obama selfie controversy um, at the Nelson you know Mandela what? It Memorial? Didn't, it, it didn't really bother me so much. Um, some, I, I heard something like on NPR, I think... Uh, no, maybe I read it. Maybe I read it. It was AP News, and the reporter was saying that, I guess the photographer who actually took the picture said, you know, this had been going, this, they were like two hours into the ceremony, and lots had happened, and there was one moment of levity, and in the beginning, I guess they were all taking pictures, and Michelle had stopped and was fo focusing on something else, and they happened to, he happened to get this shot, and the one shot that he got, not the one shot, the one shot that he got that became viral was this shot. It was like, it was a moment in the day, and it did not define the entire right. ceremony. And yeah. I kind of feel like mm -hmm. people take things out of context. And there's so many people, people who beat up on our president and find yeah. faults in every list. Like, really? This is what we're going to pick on now? We're, right. We've forgotten everything wonderful about Nelson Mandela, and we're here at his funeral yeah. and his memorial service. And what we're going to highlight is a selfie taken a in selfie. a second. <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> So. There's much bigger problems in the world. Yes. <laughs> other things to talk about. Our priorities. Our yes. priorities, like your first movie, have plenty. 
Have Plenty. Have Plenty, which was shown at the Toronto Film Festival. Yes. Aww. Now, how did you get involved with the project? Because I heard you read I, something in the paper I about did. it. I did. I booked it out of Backstage, which it used to be just a newspaper in, in New York and L.A., yeah. I guess, and now it's, you know, it's uh, more of an internet um, way to, uh, for actors to access audition material. I mean, uh, sorry, casting notices from places that are like that don't have big mm -hmm. budgets to use breakdown services whatever and um yeah i i i entered an ad in backstage and i went to the audition and then i went on the callback and i went on another callback and i booked it and it was the first thing i did and it was a tiny little film and we shot it for very little money and we uh we went to the what was the Acapulco Black Film Festival yeah. at that mm -hmm. point in time? Which it was is big. Doing that now time. the African American was the very yeah. first one, and we were chosen to be the opening movie. Warrington Hudland chose us to be the opening movie, and it was it like set the course for everything, and um, it was huge. It was a huge. It, the response was huge immediately from that audience, and it was really really wonderful. And we got picked up there by um, Tracy and Kenny Edmonds, yeah. Babyface, as some of you know. Um, um, they signed on as executive producers, and then we got into Toronto, and in Toronto, which happened, by the way, my first week of law school. Ooh. Oh, <laughs> yes. how you pull that off? <laughs> yes, <Yeah. laughs> it was my very first week of law school. We got picked up in Toronto and by uh, Harvey Weinstein and Miramax, and then we went on to do Sundance, and we had a theatrical release, and it was, it was really a big deal. And Christopher Scott Chereau was this little unknown yeah. writer, mm -hmm. director, star. And I don't know if you have it in there in your notes, <laughs> but I, he just, he's in the process of post, doing post right now on his second big film I, that I he's actually that. written, directed, and, yeah. and I'm doing that as well. And oh, congratulations. Really? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I'm so excited. He's such a talented guy. He's very quirky. I hope he doesn't mind me. You're quirky. <laughs> 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 you know that about yourself. It's that, a compliment. That's what makes you wonderful. Um, super talented interesting, unique, different, edgy, kind of offbeat guy. You know, you just kind of have to, like, get him. And mm -hmm. I get him, and he's uh, he's written this incredible, incredible script that I had to, when he sent it to me, I was, like, blown away. And, and it's very different from Half Plenty. It's, it's called, do you have the full title there? <laughs> <laughs> it's Sex and Violence, <laughs> and it's something like... Uh, does it say it there? Something like it, lesson in physics, uh, something, something in physics, and I cannot remember. But just remember, sex and violence. Do I remember that part? Um, Which I'm sure people. I think know. it's like a brief <laughs> lesson in the history of something physics. Something a brief like review Ooh, of simple physics. Thank you. you. Got it all. <laughs> the voice of God. <laughs> a brief the voice review. of God from the movie. What is it? A brief review. Say it again. Sex and violence. A brief review of simple physics. A brief, brief review, review of simple, simple physics. physics. Okay. And sex and violence. I'll, I will remember that. Sorry, Chris. Um, <laughs> The script blew me away, and we shot it, you know, and uh, it, once again, he put up his own money. We did it low, completely. He wanted to do gritty. He wanted to kind of have that have plenty experience again when we did it free of the studio, no one getting involved, and we did it. We pulled it off, and he's doing post-production now, and it's such an incredible script. But like I said, I'm sorry, I was saying very different from Half Plenty. Mm. It's very dark and edgy and feels more like a Coen Brothers Tarantino oh. kind oh. of film. Oh, I like that. Interesting. Yeah. That's definitely a, a complete twist from well, the first very one. Very different. What can you tell us about your character in it? I am, <laughs> similar to Mary Jane, <laughs> I am a wife whose husband is cheating on her. I don't okay. know how that keeps happening. <laughs> <laughs> except I don't know about it as, this, as it's going on. Um, I am a, a woman who's like nine months pregnant and it, the, all, the entire movie takes course, it takes course over maybe <coughs> sorry, it takes place over the course of maybe two days, I guess, maybe mm -hmm. like 36 hours, 48 hours tops. And uh, I'm nine months pregnant, and uh, my mother dies suddenly. And so all this is happening in the course of the movie while my husband kind of goes out on this wild ex hmm. night of extravagant living. I can't say. I don't <laughs> want to okay. give too much away. Yeah, that's and when will, that's it, will, when will it be coming out? I don't know. Okay. We're, we're going we're gonna to go out to festivals and see. And are you the only original cast member from Half Plenty that's in the film? I believe I am. Wow. Mm -hmm. Which is really... Uh, Made an impression. I did. <laughs> 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 now, when, when Half Plenty came out, you were saying you were in law school, and I know that you mentioned that your parents had a kind of right. a different direction for you. Oh, yeah. How was it for you to tell them that you had landed this role? In Half Plenty? In Half Plenty. Um, well, I shot it actually before law school, so it didn't, it didn't really matter. Them, to them, it was like a dalliance. And then 
when the movie was picked up, you know, it's kind of like, well, you're not leaving law school. <laughs> you're not. I was like, no, I'm not. And that's part of the reason I, I, I was really mainly applying to schools in New York and L.A. because I kind of wanted to, um, if I could continue to pursue the acting, I was going to. And so I, went to, I was at Columbia, and I was able to do both. I mm. went on auditions, and I went to class, and I made it happen, and I graduated on time, and I took the bar with the rest of my class wow. in New York. Oh, my and goodness. Then, and then turned around and said, okay, that's, that part of my life is, is fine. I can go back to it if I really want to go back to it. I'm still a member of the bar in New York, should I want to practice, I suppose. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's done, and I, I kind of knew that wasn't really where my real my true passion was i mean overachiever all the way I know, i'm like i'm i need to geez. step up my game <laughs> i could have gone to law school mom. i'm like, sorry <laughs> I'm like, sorry yeah. i hope i'm not bringing up any bad i'm like wow like, <laughs> we're having moments over here on this, <laughs> on this uh, table here <laughs> now did your life change a lot after you did the film have plenty i mean no <laughs> you know what that first it felt like it did and there were moments like when we went to sundance it was surreal because like i said i was a student I'm sorry, this thing is pinching my earring. Um, I was a student at the time. I took off like two weeks or whatever, and I got permission from my pr professors and took all my books. And I had this one life in New York, and then we went to Sundance, and it was huge. I mean, it was like meeting celebrities that you've, that actors you've admired forever, and tons of press, and um, getting to see other incredible films. Like, I'm trying to think of what was there when we were there. Like, The Big Lebowski was there. Oh, like Big Lebowski, yeah. Um, it was just like, wow, this is a whole other world. And the doors opened, not, not to say they opened so quickly, but relatively quickly. And uh, we were really excited and thought this was going to be the rest of our lives. And then no, not so much. <laughs> 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 I haven't been back to Sundance yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a, a, a few years, let's say. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's like, th I feel like my career or acting can be very, it, it, a lot of it's luck. And you you need to be in the right place at the right time, and then when you get there, you'd better have the talent to back it up, and then you can yeah. continue to do that. But then you want the, the talent to back it up, and then, then you have the luck again of that project actually really succeeding and hitting yeah. big, and people responding to it, and then you get your next project. And um, So I feel like it's a lot of stops and starts, and you feel like, oh, wow, this is great, and then you're back to auditioning the next day. And then you're, you get something really big, like when I did National Security, that was a really big deal when yeah. I booked that. Um, when I booked Hitch, I thought everything was going to change, and then they they edited my part down to like <laughs> five <laughs> minutes, and I was like, great. But I remember your part, though. Thank you. I it was your part. a much larger part when I <laughs> when I tell you the first script, but like that doesn't really matter because no one really knows except for, well, yeah, there's a select group of us who know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so then it's like, okay, I'm back to auditioning again, and we'll see. And but you, you kind of just you do it for the love of it because I love. I love the craft. I love yeah. I love acting, but I love being around that world. I love other actors. I love being around other artists and and all the different pieces of the puzzle that make it that want to make this come to life and make movie magic. I just I think it's it's really unique and special. I see the sparkle in your eye. It, it because when it works <laughs> and when it all comes it together, it's like you, you you have to pinch yourself. It's like I'm doing what I've always wanted to do, what I dream of doing, and Yes, a lot of times it becomes about the the dollar and like how many seats you sell or whatever it is yeah. or tickets you sell. But being on the on the on the receiving end of that, and I I feel that way all the time. That's why it was I was drawn to the business, being an audience member and having connecting with something on the screen that touches you in such a way that you're sitting there in your seat just crying. You can't get up and you have to watch all the credits and you can't <laughs> move. Like yeah. if I can affect people that way, because I've been affected by that way so many times, and that that's why I keep doing it. Now, you work with a lot of heavy hitters, Will Smith, Martin Lawrence, you mentioned, uh, Don Cheadle, yes. Sarah Michelle Gellar, uh, yes. Bill Duke. Who, who, is, who do you love to work with, or who have you loved to work with the most? Um, I I'm sure it's a hard question with all those people. <laughs> I, I know. Oh, I, I can't pick a favorite. I don't know. <laughs> well, what's the one that you it's remember? All, the, the I have a great time whenever I work with Will. I did, I did Hitch and Seven Pounds with Will. He's... He's pretty much Will Smith. Like, yeah. what you see is what you get. And, like, he's that dynamic from the morning when he steps into the makeup trailer till, you know, we cut and we check the gates, like, martini shot, and we're done for the day. Like, he never stops being this wonderful, approachable guy. And he never turns down an autograph or a picture. Like, he's just, 
a really great guy, and I think that's why he's the movie star that he is. And he's a great actor, yes, but he's got this personality outside of that that's big and warm and brings people in, and it's kind of wonderful to see that happen. And so that that was that was great. Don Cheadle was amazing because, like, gosh, I've admired his work for so long. And the first day, <laughs> so the first day in the set. I made the first five minutes, I had this like, oh my God, it's Dan Cheadle, what am I doing? I'm doing I'm <laughs> <laughs> and I had to like go into my chair like, you have this part, this part is yours, they wanted you for a reason, you can handle it. <laughs> so like I, had that, I really had to have like a little talk with myself because you can really talk yourself kind out of a role. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, or out of your confidence. Yeah. Like, yeah, you really can. <laughs> Did yeah. anyone give you any key advice while you were kind of in that beginning process in your career, a Will Smith or a Don Cheadle? Um, Key advice or something that you kind of took and you you learned from them and you're like you know what I'm gonna use this. I learned. Uh, yeah, I definitely I definitely sure. steal things and and a lot of times it's it's actor things and not. Um, Will <coughs> said once um, that he doesn't turn down any uh, off. I mean, uh, asks for in for sorry for um, pictures or ha or a handshake or a yeah. hug or whatever just because you he says you have to realize that what might be just a moment in your life could be something much more consequential than someone else's it's true and it's That's like if, if you don't know who that person is asking you for the question for all you uh, all you know they have your posters on their w wall they've loved you forever and they get two minutes with you and if you ruin your image of them i mean their image of you it's like that can really, really hurt them. And yeah. it's like, it takes nothing from your day to be like, sure, I'll take a picture. Thank you so much for coming out. I really appreciate you being here and, and admiring my work. And I thought that was really, really big of him and to see, to see it that way, to see people as individuals and everyone's got their story and you don't know and it takes nothing for you to stop and smile for a picture or sign your name and, and be nice. And everyone says that about Will. I mean, everyone but seems to have true. that same Versa. comment. It's mm -hmm. true, although he does say what gives him an advantage that he's tall. Yeah. Like, so it doesn't feel <laughs> like tall. okay people okay so many people like you know what i mean like he's he's usually one of the taller guys in the room and so it doesn't feel too claustrophobic i think as a woman and being a petite woman it, it can but as long as you just treat people with respect yeah that's what it's all about mm -hmm. yeah. now what did you do specifically obviously you've con constantly worked over the years yes. and had multiple jobs and things like that what do you think you were doing specifically that kept your career going constantly, and you didn't seem um, to have that? I stayed in class. Um, I'm not in class right now, but I've been in and out of different classes over the years. And when I say in and class, like I could be in class for four years, three years in one class, and, and a, a scene study class. And it keeps you sharp when yeah. you're not working, and it keeps you on your toes, and it, and it allows you to explore in parts that you might not necessarily be given. I mean, um, there, I don't want to like complain like, oh, there are no black roles out, the roles out there for black women. But, you know, <laughs> there are not a ton. And in class, you can explore all of your dreams. You can play Juliet and Romeo and Juliet. You can play Lady Macbeth. You can play, you know, you can do it all. I mean, I've done scene studies in class where I've played, um, oh, goodness, her name is, is Frances McDormand. Is that her name? Yes. Her role in Fargo. Oh, Fargo, you know? yeah. Like, I get to, <laughs> when I was very pregnant with my daughter, <laughs> <laughs> when I was still in acting class, my, my coach was like, we're, we're putting up that scene, we're going to do the scene in Fargo. And it's like, <laughs> I was playing it really seven months pregnant with the accent and all, and it was like, it was great. Like, when do you get to do that? And I, I really think it's important to do that. And, and when you're in a scene study class and it, with a really good teacher, I've had great teachers, uh, Adam Lazar White is one, Jane Fleiss is another, um, Sandra Lee is another in New York. Sherry Shaw, sorry, I'm just <laughs> thinking of people that yeah, really influence yeah. me, <laughs> that they make you do the homework in a way that you don't have to do for an audition, and you may not even do for, you probably won't do for a guest star in a TV role, you may not even do for a film unless you learn that craft, like you build your, there's so much on the page, and then you build your character's history, and you layer in things um, that you bring to the table, that you've created, and that you can go out there and look for, and yeah. And I think that's that, that makes you a deeper artist. And so that's what I, when I'm not working, that's the kind of stuff I do to keep me fresh keep and, and keep the, uh, and, and feeling like I, I'm still learning mm -hmm. and I'm still evolving. You mentioned that uh, the kind of the lack of, of roles for black actresses, but since you've had your career from the beginning, do you think that there are 
more opportunities now for actresses. I mean, we have the success of obviously um, Scandal. You, scandal. And, and you know, <laughs> I was just talking to, I, on the car ride over here, I was talking to my friend Sandra, Sandra Prosper, who's an also another great actress, and we came up together doing stuff in New York first. And she was telling me that Nia Long just booked this TV show that I went out for. It's called mm -hmm. The Divide. And if, it's, if I'm wrong, I totally apologize. <laughs> but I heard that she booked it and I'd auditioned for it. And it's uh, Tony Goldwyn, who okay. is, is a f the president on Scandal. Yeah. It's when it's he's producing this project. Oh, okay. It's such an incredible script and such an incredible role for a black mm -hmm. woman. And I just read that she got it. And I thought, God, if that's on the air... She's a lawyer, and she's dealing with, well, you know, she's a really strong woman, and she's got this husband who I think, maybe he works in the DA's office. And anyway, th it's loaded and, and, and layered, and it's like, if that's on the same time that Scandal's on and the same time that Being Mary Jane is on, that would be a huge coup for us to have three shows with black female leads yeah. who are smart, who are educated, who are doing things, and like, it's just, and, and multifaceted, and layered, mm -hmm. and, and complex, and we just don't get that. And I feel like, wow, it, it's finally coming back. And I did, I felt like when I first got into it, in like the 90s, or late 90s, I was inspired by all the images. And not that they were wonderful images, but we had so many films out. At a, there was a point in time when there was like, everything from, you know, all Spike Lee stuff to John Singleton's things, to like, yeah. you know, the, the, the um, oh gosh, Alan, Hughes Brothers. brothers. Yeah, yeah brothers. their things were like everyone. The, there were black movies out all the time. Yeah. It was like, look, we can work. Yeah. And then there was like this huge dearth of like <laughs> nothing, <laughs> nothing but Tyler Perry for a long time. That's true. And Tyler Perry has kept many of us going. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, thank you to Tyler Perry. But that was it. And I feel like we're on the upswing now. And I, th I, 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 I want to believe it's Scandal. It's Think Like a Man. It's um, the success of. Best Man Holiday, Best I hope. Best Man Holiday mm -hmm. was huge. This year in black film, I mean, just like, I mean, outside of the comedy stuff, but like, you know, obviously 12 Years a Slave and, and The Butler and um, Fruitvale Station. I mean, it's really, it's mm -hmm. coming. I, I want to believe it, it's coming back. There was so a line in that Bill Bellamy movie. What was that Bill Bellamy <laughs> oh, movie? Oh, How to Be a, pl how how to to be a Player. player. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw that like sidekick. two weeks ago. Who was a light-skinned sidekick? Oh, like, like yeah, your brother. Yeah. He's like, I know, I know we're not hot. We're coming we're back, back, man. We're coming back. <laughs> <laughs> so I really feel like we're coming back. We're coming back. Yeah, it's coming back. <laughs> So being on the inside, do you feel like uh, this is just sort of a part of the cycle, like we're in right now and it's going to go out again? Or are you optimistic I'm that optimistic. this is something that may stay? I'm optimistic. I remember when, I almost said when the Obamas were elected. When <laughs> Barack Obama <laughs> well, <basically>. was elected. <laughs> when the Obamas were in the, were, were first came to Washington and the White House, I was so excited because I thought there are going to be so many more roles for educated black women. Because they're going to be like, oh, we need a Michelle Obama type. We need a... Mm -hmm. And nothing happened it took a really long time and my husband said to me he's like i i don't want to get you to get your hopes up but i really feel like there are going to be progressive people who feel like well we voted for him we've done our part we don't have part. to go and you know <laughs> diversify everything on yeah. television yeah. and film yeah. it's like we've got a black president what, 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 what more do you guys want yeah and i feel like he was right there was a period that was like it was still fairly not so diverse and it's it's starting to turn around, and I'm hoping it will it will continue to do so because it's there's so many great artists out there of color, and not just black artists, but Latino mm -hmm. and Asian and Native American. I mean, just everything, Indian, the full gamut. And we have so many interesting stories to tell that are outside of what we think of as mainstream American stories that they have out there. And I want to see it all. I want to experience it all. And I, and I feel like we only grow from that. And I've I've seen a couple articles with with uh, other black actresses and they said that it seemed to be a consensus that when you walk into a room now to audition you're taken a little bit more seriously than you have in the past. In the past. So I'm, I'm hopeful that that will continue. That would, that would be <laughs> lovely. That would be nice. That would be great. And then yeah. you mentioned movies and we have this year for the Oscars which we have Fruitville and, and The Butler and, and, the, and 12 Years, uh, a, slave. 12 years a Slave. Yeah. Do you think that the Oscars will really reflect how positive and great those films were by giving them awards or do you think that this is something that's it's hype right now but then when it comes down to award um, season, it'll be passed by. Well, 12 Years a Slave, I think, is leading or tied yeah, in the Golden Globe. Golden Globe it's tied for the Golden Globe, yeah. yeah. It's and it's got a bunch for With SAG August. Awards as well. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's definitely going to be nominated and and has a really good chance of, of doing well, performing well and for good reason. 
um, I think it opens people's eyes in a way that they don't necessarily sure. want them to be <laughs> open, <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but, which is good. <laughs> but I think it's also important that we have stories that are uplifting out there and not every, um, I don't want to, I don't, I hate to say this because it's, there is some truth to it, but I, I, I don't like the fact that, or I don't, I don't want to say I don't like the fact, I would love to see more films be considered for, and, and, and performers of color be considered for the Oscar that were not just telling these downtrodden stories yeah, of I like, agree oh, <laughs> we are the help, or oh, yeah. we are obese and beating our children, yes. oh, yeah. we are getting killed in the gas, in the train station, oh, we are slaves, and I, there are people of color doing wonderful things and achieving great um, heights, and I'd like to see that portrayed and recognized and, and ideally uh, awarded. It would be nice. Mm -hmm. It would be nice. Yeah. If you could uh, sort of come up with your recipe for progression of people <laughs> of color <laughs> I like that. in this business, recipe for progression. Uh, what would progression. be your recipe for <clears throat> progression from producing things that are more reflective of the culture? And um, so I write. I'm writing my own stuff now. I'm, I have friends who write. I think it's important that you tell different stories and it's not the same story. Get your people together get a crew together. I mean, I think I feel like actors meet other actors in acting class. And once you do an indie or two, you start, you, you know people you can reach out to. And you, if you, re you have a DP and he has his crew, make our own projects, make mm -hmm. little indie films. And don't, I mean, I, I want to say don't waste, don't waste the opportunity. But I think if, you, if you're using your own money, you won't waste the opportunity. That's true. <laughs> Put your own stuff out there and get it seen and go out to festivals and, and tell the story. Like, like how Ava DuVernay started out yeah. with and like middle of nowhere. And yeah, she did. I mean, it's, you can't, you can't wait for studios to give you the green light to do something for $20 million, to do it for a million, do it for a hundred thousand, do what you can and continue to put out as m many stories as possible that are viable and, and real. And even if they're not real, even if it's your most ridiculous, not ridiculous, but most, um, I don't know, idolize, imagine fiction of your, your fantasy of a black superhero, whatever, do it. Yeah. Like, create your stuff and do it and just and know that if you believe in it enough, someone's going to see it and, and say, you know what, this is good and this is different and it's not what we've seen. And I think we're just so hungry for images of ourselves out there now and people will respond and, and be happy to see something new. Yeah, and then the great thing is too, we have social media, which can help. You exactly. know, you can push your film out that way. Uh, we, you know, we've mentioned Obama, but I think that that helps too. Just right. to kind of <laughs> people if you paying can get attention a to your project. Your film at the White House. Yes, yes, please go amazing. to Obama. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Obama dot com. No, I have no um, <laughs> But yeah, I think I think that's yeah. Tweet. I mean, I've met so many independent filmmakers on Twitter. I met Ava DuVernay on Twitter. I met Matthew Cherry on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've met people yeah through social media or and Instagram. Like it's. It's really kind of interesting how the world is changing and it opens yeah. you up and you have access to people that you did not have 10 years ago. Yeah, that's true. You do. And if you have something viable and smart and good that you want to put out there, you can make those connections and, and do it. And don't feel like you're in this, um, even if you're like living in a small town somewhere <laughs> in West Virginia, <laughs> don't, you're, you're not really because you've got this worldwide web thing that connects you to everyone. To everybody, yeah, universally. Yeah. Now, uh, the big series is coming out nice. January 7th. Mary, Mary Jane. Mary Jane. Viable and brilliant. Viable and brilliant. And the market has been brilliant. Oh I see goodness. the ads mm. everywhere, and the anticipation is huge. Yes. Uh, first of all, huge. Um, I, I don't even know who to start thanking. Uh, Mara Brockakil for coming up with this character. Yeah, she's unbelievable. She's just, we were talking about <laughs> my, um, my girlfriend and I on the phone the way over here, like how she's like Superwoman. Like she's. She's beautiful. She's got a great marriage. She's got two cute kids. She's an incredible writer. She's smart. Like, there's nothing this woman cannot do. But she has created a project that I am so proud to be a part of. And she's written it so well and multi layered and multifaceted. And it's, it's just incredible. And Salim is an awesome director. Yeah. It was really, I, my first time working with him was on this project. And it was, I love the way he. He um, directors find different ways to kind of like needle you or pull at certain things to get certain things out of your performance. And some of them do it in a way that can be abrasive or abusive or not very nice. And you know what they're going for, but you'd wish they'd taken a different tact. And some of them don't even know how to do it. And like, you, 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 
in your, if you're in this business long enough, you run, the, you meet the full spectrum. Right. He has a way of bringing you to do something, and you feel like, damn, that was good. And he was like, that was really good. Now try it. But da -da -da -da. And it's like, <laughs> man, I just gave you something that was good. <laughs> you knew that was good. I knew that was good. Everyone knows that was good. <laughs> what are we doing? I'm tired. <laughs> but it's like, do it, now that you're tired, Let's do it again. Let's take it to another level. Right. And it's like, that was great, whatever. But now I want to do it. Now you're, now you're getting angry at me. Do it again. <laughs> like, it was just, he just kept pushing you and pushing you into a way that it was not abrasive or abusive at all it was just like wow i didn't know i could even get to this like thank you thank you for this opportunity and letting us play and and omari and i especially we had we had much more when gabrielle and i shoot together it's, it's much more confrontational and we play but it's still within a certain framework because we're strangers you know as characters but omari and i are a married a long time married couple who's going through this like hell and when we get to play it's like Mara said to me that he's like when I watch those scenes, it's like jazz. Yeah, and I really feel like that's what it was. Like we had such an incredible time, tearing each other up and ripping each other apart, and loving each other and adoring each other and hating each other and loathing each other, all within a scene, over and over and over again. <laughs> and um, it was really wonderful for them to to l allow us to do that. And BET has just been so incredible championing this project and putting it out there and. Hopefully, people will watch and tune in, and I think they will love it. Our, Gabrielle's work is tremendous. <laughs> and I, I, yesterday I saw, we, we had the premiere in L.A. here for the, the first um, episode of the first season, and I saw performances by Lisa Vidal that I hadn't seen before yeah. that were just, like, blew <laughs> me out of the water. And Latarsha Rose, who's also a longtime friend of love mine. Love Latarsha. Mm -hmm. um, like, and, like, her work is just, ever, across the board, yeah. the acting is supreme, and it's, it's different, and we haven't even, we don't see these actors enough, and they've finally been given opportunity to really play and do their thing, and it's good. It's really good. <laughs> That's what good. everyone. And I'm a little biased. Every, no, everyone's <laughs> saying the buzz is good. out for this show. It's good. And then you, you play Avery Daniels, and, Avery and so Daniels. Amari is your husband, and he's yes. having an affair with Gabrielle He's having Yans. an affair with Gabrielle, yes. Now, it, you guys or have been. With Mary Jane, I should say. With Mary Jane, <laughs> Before yes. we started the <laughs> Sorry, I know, right? I know. I know. No, it'll be all, Wayne, it'll be all over not Twitter when we not leave here. What right. happened? <laughs> Since you and Gabrielle have been friends for so long, is it tough when those scenes where you have to kind of go at each other, is it it's tough? It's easier because we have, we don't have to worry about each other's feelings. Feelings like, oh, what, this actor doesn't know me. Does she know that I, I'm not really that angry at her? You know what I mean? Like yeah. when you're meeting a, a, a new actor, you you kind of have to quickly figure out your relationship and your in your character's history and and it, how each other works and reacts and what's going to tick you off or offend you or whatever. Yeah. Like it's hard to know like how much you can push someone's buttons before they feel like maybe she's crossed the line and now she's not acting or or she's t you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's, mm -hmm. it's you can feel that it's a weird kind of thing. It can yeah. be very weird. Um, we hit the ground running because we know each other so well, and it was we just jumped into it. and We had a blast, and it was it was really lovely. It's it's like you know it's like playing with your sister. It's like doing dress up with your <laughs> sister. It's like someone's paying <laughs> us, and we're just <laughs> playing, and they're doing our hair and makeup, and there are lights and cameras here, and like and we can just do this. And it was really great. And your characters, uh, I think I read that you have a type A personality yes, type. Yes, I'm very type A. How similar in real life are you to your character? A little too similar, probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's a lawyer, too. She's got two kids. She's happily married, or so she thinks. Um, she's probably, <coughs> excuse me, probably a little more reserved and conservative than I am. Um, and she's a little more... Uh, maybe tolerant of her husband's indiscretion than I would be. <laughs> <laughs> that's a nice that's way of putting that's it. Like, yeah, that's <laughs> a very politically correct way of saying yes. it. <laughs> um, but otherwise, there, there are a lot of similarities, except that, yeah, and she's, she's definitely stronger and more confident than I am, I think. Because mm -hmm. I know that when I'm playing her, I feel like I'm, I'm bringing on something that's not me. Like, I don't, it's very, she doesn't have very much vulnerability, which I, I feel like I naturally do. And I have to like fight against that every time they say action. It's like, okay, that's, I have to check Robin at the door. There are a couple of scenes where her, the vulnerability comes through, but for the most part, it's, she's like not letting you see what's really go, going on. What's in going the, on the, not, not the sadness anyway, or the grief or the desperation. Was that the most challenging part for you about playing her? Yes. Yes, I would say so. And what do you think that, how, how did she kind of, like, that character help you in real life as far as, like, expanding who you are as a person? Um, 
well, if my husband ever cheats on me, I will know how to go about <laughs> it. I will know how to approach the, <laughs> the, the mistress. <laughs> And <laughs> not just use a gun like with my original plan. No. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I think that she's, uh, it, it, it kind of, it's kind of n nice to know that you can put on this brave face and have a steely front when you feel like your insides are crumbling. Yeah. And I, I, I don't, that doesn't often happen to me. Like I don't. I just, I, because I'm an actor and I like to feel, I allow my insides to crumble. Like, oh my God, this is the worst <laughs> thing. And my, like, I've got this little, my first real acting teacher, Sandra Lee, is back in New York. And she's this, she's like this older woman. She played Tiger Lily, I think it was in the original <laughs> Peter Pan. And she's, pint, like, she might be four foot ten on a good day. And, <laughs> but she was like dynamic and strong. And she'd always tell you, an actor never forgets. An actor never forgets. And like, you remember everything. And, and whenever I'm feeling something really huge, I've got this, an actor never forgets. <laughs> so I'll be at a friend's funeral. And part of me, is, there's a little nagging thing like, remember this, remember this, you're going to need this. I'm like, go away. I need to just be in this. <laughs> but I really feel like as an actor, I just feel everything. And, and this character is about like, I'm not going to, even if I am feeling all that, you're not going to see it. Now, how do you balance all of this? You you have you're an in demand actress. You are you just wrote a novel. I did. And and family. How do you balance all three of those things? Um, I don't get a lot of sleep. <laughs> I, I would imagine not. I don't get a lot of sleep. Uh, I feel like there's a time for everything. I mean, um, when I'm not acting, I'm you know, there, there are periods that when you're not acting, even if you're working on a project, you can be in, you're not, they're not shooting. And so like with Mary, being Mary Jane, we shot in Atlanta, but if I'm back in LA, I'm not acting. And so I've got time to be with my kids and my husband, and I've got time to write when my kids are in school, and I've time to like do things for myself. And when I'm working, I'm working, and that's pretty much it. Unless I'm on location, then once you're, you have days off on location, you've got nothing to do, and everyone else is working, you don't have any friends, you're in a, you know, <laughs> depending where, I just came back from, doing a TV show called Mind Games. Mm -hmm. It's a new ABC uh, mid-season replacement with Steve Zahn and mm. Kristen Slater, and I shot it in Chicago. I'd never been to Chicago, and I got to explore Chicago, and I got to start writing a new, no a new f screenplay. Like, I got to, like, do a lot of things, because I had, in my downtime, there's nothing to do. And I've, none of my friends, I don't have very many friends in Chicago, but if I do, they're not actors, so they're not like free. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Can anyone have brunch today? Right, right. What do you mean you guys have brunch? Right. It's Wednesday. What are you what talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it's really a luxury of living in LA that someone is yeah, free to see you at any point. Anytime time. And you forget too <laughs> you while you're totally here. You know, but you go back other places. You're like, wait a minute, like, no, this isn't the reality. Right. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> Where are you all going at nine in the morning? <laughs> All right, speaking of writing, can you tell us a little bit about your book? And um, I spent, I, it's, a, it's a labor of love. It's a novel that I spent uh, about five years working on, this past five years. And uh, it's a love story at the heart of it. It's, it's um, I guess, a little semi-autobiographical about this woman looking back um, at her youth and a relationship in speci specifically that changed the course of her life. And she is a Jamaican Chinese woman living in New York and uh, struggling with figuring out what to do with her life and you know expectations from her parents and her friends and wanting to tap into her artistic creative side but feeling like she can't because her family's expecting too much of her. And she gets on a train one day and she meets this man who's the complete opposite of her and it opens her up to new ideas and new ways of thinking and just new ways of viewing herself and it's kind of about her search for identity. And where can fans find your book? Right now, nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> but once, I, once it's out there, once I get a publisher and, and this, it's signed, sealed, and delivered, I will, uh, I, don't, I will be tweeting it and Facebooking it and Instagramming it and, and publicizing it. All and we'll have, we'll have it here on BHL, <laughs> too. BHL yes, back. I'll be back to, to talk promote about it. The book. Exactly. Yes. What made you say, I'm going to write a book? Oh, God. Um, what made me say I was going to write a book? Uh, I've always written. Like, I did it. For, I do it for fun. It's always been some a way for me to clear my head. Um, from the time I was little, it was like that was a thing. The two things I did were act and write. And uh, I, 
wrote my first book when I was 14, and it was like 884 pages, <laughs> but <laughs> handwritten. And uh, <laughs> I know, and it's in my garage. <laughs> if anyone wants, I to was going to say, do you still have I it? Still have what it. was that about? Yeah, uh, I don't, even, t- I don't, want to, I don't even want to tell you what it was about. <laughs> 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 what, what do you think 14-year-olds write about when their <laughs> imaginations go wild? Um, and then I started another book <laughs> when I was like 16. That went up to about 1,200 pages, and I thought, this is not going anywhere. And I put it away and I, I kind of felt like I've, I've spent my entire life starting books and then like putting it aside and then this one I started off as just the first opening chapter and I really really liked it and then I thought I'm going to give it a try for another chapter and then another chapter and then after three chapters and I was like um, not only am I going to finish this and make this a book but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to publish this one this is the one that was the one that was, that was that the winner one. yeah and I feel like it was just being older and having more perspective and becoming a better writer and having more life experience and, and a less myopic view of the world that you kind of you're able to bring in your your life and your experiences and I think it makes a fuller story. You've also added producer to your credits and uh, yes. you had a film called Gosh, it Miss makes me sound, I'm getting hot and it's it's not, very warm. It makes me sound <laughs> like warm. I'm busy then I'm really no, Listen, you have a, hey, I looked you, at your resume. You're pretty busy. Multi-talented Multi-talented career. actress, writer, producer. <laughs> so um, it's Miss Dial. Miss Dial. And it's a comedy. It's a comedy. Uh, it came out earlier this year. You can find it in, on iTunes or Amazon or Netflix, um, Redbox, I think. There's a bunch of places. You just, I guess if you just Google it, you'll find it. And Mrs. M-I-S-S dial. And it's, uh, it was this concept I came up with a couple of years ago. My husband originally came up with this idea of what if you could do a movie with no two actors in the same shot. Hmm. Like, and ideally, like... Theoretically, they could upload themselves in their remote places with the camera. And then we figured out that that couldn't be done because you'd have issues with sound and lighting and so forth. But we approached a friend of ours, his writer, director, um, Dave Steinberg. And David said, you know what, I could write a script with a story with no two actors in the same shot. Let, let me give it a shot. And we're like, okay, go for it. And he came up with the Miss Dell script. And he, he did it like in three weeks or something crazy. <laughs> like, like, it was unbelievable. And... It was really good and really enjoyable, and we thought, okay, let's let's do this. And um, Dave got the money from his parents, and <laughs> like I said, get your friends, get, get your together, parents, get whoever you can get a um, get your crew. We got we got a crew. We hired all of our friends. That's why you'll see like Gabrielle has a has a cameo in it. Dule Hill has a cameo. <laughs> Hill Harper has a cameo. <laughs> like I pulled out everyone I know. Nicole Lynn. Like I mean, it was it was great. We we just and we did it. We shot it. I believe yeah, ten days. And would you like to do more producing? Yes. There's a part of it that really appeals to me. I think it appeals to the lawyer side of me, like mm-hmm. that um, problem solving, really, analytical. It's, it's, it's producing is a lot like uh, putting together a really big, big puzzle. And yeah. Maybe that's what it is, or maybe it's something else. <laughs> because sometimes <laughs> one piece falls out and everything. Maybe it's like putting together a house of cards, and one card comes out, everything <laughs> comes tumbling down, and you're trying to, like, Get it back together again because you're you're really putting in all these when you're doing and anyway specifically with a, a low budget, so much can go wrong. And yeah, that's true. And you really are depending on people to show up when they say they're going to show up and keep their word and and perform and do everything in in a good <laughs> manner and a timely <laughs> manner and um and put it together. And it, this was great. We had the opportunity to work with our friends and that's always we fun. Cranked it out. We had an incredible uh, production manager who's now producer as well. Um, Elizabeth Hughes, and she ran a tight ship. She was like this <laughs> tiny little woman. She's about 5'2", maybe. And I've never seen a UPM like this. I mean, we every day we were on time. Like, it was, and, and like, incredible. Like, we did, a, we did a feature-length film in 10 days. Like, studios, just That's to give you crazy. an idea, they yeah. do a feature-length film in, like, three months. Three months, I was going to say, yeah. yeah. And was it difficult to wear Oof. both hats? I mean, being the act, actor in the film um, and, and also kind of producing and No, really I've d- I'd done it before. We did something called This Is Not a Test that I shot in, I don't know, 2006 with Hill Harper uh, yep. and uh, Bellamy Young, who's now on Scandal. She's a first lady mm-hmm. on Scandal. And Tom Arnold. Um, so I've done it before, and I kind of like it. I don't know if I could direct an act. Like, I see what people like Chris Chirot when I'm in yeah. a scene with him, and he's like, hold on. Let me see the whatever. And he gets back into the shot. Yeah, and he's, like, like and he's pulling. Yeah. He's like, let me see how that looks. No, no, no. Turn a little. Okay. 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 Action. And <laughs> it's just like, I was like, I don't know how you do that because I need to be in my acting. Yeah. That's, yeah. Seems like um, difficult. And I feel like when you're producing, you can be in your actor hat when you're acting. But in between action and cut, 
or between cut and the next action, whatever, <laughs> you can go back into producing if you need to. I feel like the director, you've got to be there the entire time. That's just my, but I'm, I think people would probably agree. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Yeah. <laughs> do you do? Know, do you, I can't imagine yeah, how like, you direct and I, I, don't, I don't know yeah. how. I, uh, it's yeah. a challenge, I'm sure. It's a special it kind of brain that works. Yeah, yeah. I was going to so say, you got to use different cool. parts of the brain yeah. for that yeah. one. Which is why I said Chris Chirot is, you know, he's quirky and offbeat, but he's pretty brilliant in yeah. what he does. For sure. What role would you like to play that you haven't played yet? Ooh. I never know the right answer to this one. Um, I mean, I feel like I think about this all the time, and then, I, I, and, and then it escapes me. I would love to do a great period piece mm. um, and maybe something unexpected um, like some period, like like something that takes place in like Moorish Spain in, in like the 1600s or whatever, like that we don't see people of color in because yeah. I don't know why they seem to take us out of period pieces unless <laughs> we're there, apparently. Yeah, yeah, apparently. <laughs> but like, we were where there. we weren't there, we didn't maybe. exist. <laughs> <laughs> something like that, or, you know, something... Maybe a French film. A French, I would love to do that. There's a, I was researching, I've begun researching on the, the story of this, um, this French slave, and I can't, a slave who was in France who kind of thought she was, she didn't think she was white, because she was dark-skinned, but she mm. thought she was like everyone else. And it was this realization. It was based on a true. It was based on a true story. I think it takes place like in the 1700s, something like that. Mm. I mm. would love to do. I'd love to have the opportunity to do it. I think you should produce and write right. and direct that and star in it and mm -hmm. get an Oscar and all that. I fun would stuff. love that. <laughs> and I'm working on something now that I'm really excited. About. I don't want to talk about it, but it's it's something that this is the project I'm writing now that I would love to. I'm going to produce and and star in. Oh, an Oscar's a little... <laughs> <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> Whatever, we'll see. I got a plan for you, Robin. I got a plan for you. Who do you want to work with that you haven't worked with yet? Uh, Kate Blanchett. <sighs> She's unbelievable. That'd be great. Yeah. Uh, Matt Damon. Viola Davis. Meryl Streep. <laughs> I'm never like... She's like, I'm the just, list goes on. I know. <laughs> That's a good one. Sorry. <laughs> If you could use one word to define Oh, Denzel. Oh, oh, of course, Denzel. I have not met Denzel. I was, I, really? I was, yes, which is kind of crazy because I feel like I've been in Hollywood so long and black Hollywood is only so small and you, you at least see, see everyone yeah. eventually at a yeah. party or something. I've never even seen Denzel in person. And the irony is that Denzel's mom was my mother's hairdresser for years <laughs> and did my mom's hair for her wedding. I know that's totally Small not... World. That's totally okay. Hey, <laughs> it all works. And you know what? Now you put it out in the universe. Yes. So what's going to happen Somebody's is you're going to leave here Denzel. and yeah, you're going to run into Denzel. Denzel. I'm like, I'm like, exactly. I'm like, I was just, I was just talking, talking about, about you. you. Oh, Black Hollywood Live. <laughs> <laughs> if you could use one word to define you, what would it be? Uh, passionate. It's hmm. a great word. And I determined. Think. Determined as well. I don't know which one. Passionately determined. Passionately, Passionately determined. determined. And where can fans find you on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and all at that fun Robin stuff? At Robin Lee, at Robin Lee, and on Facebook, I believe it's the Robin Lee. The Robin Lee, Courtney. Yes, I You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Stuart Starlet. You Stuart. can find me at Daryl Kristen on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And be sure to tune in. January 7th January to 7th, BET, 7, 10 p.m. 10 p.m. Be Mary Jane. You're going to see Robin and all of her greatness. Thank you. And we're <laughs> so looking excited. forward to it. Tell a friend. Bring a group. Have a, a have Be a Mary party. Jane party. Make sure you support it. It's going to be a great show. And we'll be live tweeting as well. So. Oh, yes. Thank you for watching Black Hollywood Live Portraits with Robin Lee. And we will see you soon. Thank you. From producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Speaker, Gary Kristen, and the entire BHL staff, we would like to thank you for tuning in to the Black Hollywood Live Network. If you have questions or comments, tweet us at BHL Online or email us at info at blackhollywoodlive.com. For more exclusive content, visit blackhollywoodlive.com. This has been a presentation of the Black Hollywood Live Network. Hollywood, Hollywood redefined. redefined. The views expressed here are those of the host only and do not necessarily reflect the views of BHL or its owners or principals. Thanks for watching Black Hollywood Live on YouTube. For more in depth interviews and news, subscribe to our channel here and be sure to share your opinion in the comment section below here. See you soon, everyone. Bye.